everyone, and welcome to The Circle Opens, a podcast devoted to a chapter-by-chapter review of Stephen King's The Stand. Need an affordable source for Stephen King books, movies, collectibles, and more? Make sure to visit Secondhand Bookery at secondhandbookery.etsy.com. Listeners of this podcast can use the coupon code The Circle for 20% off their order anytime, and there's always free shipping to the United States. That's Secondhand Bookery at secondhandbookery.etsy.com. Welcome back, everybody. I am Sarah, and thank you so much for joining me this week on our journey through the stand. We are still in the midst of the coronavirus outbreak, which I am sure you all know. Um, I'm not going to delve too deeply into that today because, let's face it, you've heard enough of it um, about it on the news and social media and saturation of bad news is really bad for mental health. (laughs) So I'm just going to say that I hope that you are all staying safe and you are all healthy. And I hope that this episode will provide um, some much needed distraction for your week. I don't really have much to say um, other than we are just going to jump into this chapter. This is episode 43 We are in chapter 46 of book two on the border. To recap chapter 45, we met 108-year-old Abigail Fremantle, also known as Mother Abigail, from Hemingford Home, Nebraska. We got a lot of background into Abigail's history and what her role will be going forward. Nick, Tom, and Ralph are also the first group of survivors to find Mother Abigail, Um, Abigail and Nick communicate quite a bit, and Abigail reveals that he is a leader, that God has his finger on Nick's heart. After some discussion, the group decides to leave Nebraska to head for Boulder, Colorado, thanks to several messages that Abigail says that she has received from God. In Chapter 46, we are back with Stu Redman's party. It's Stu, Fran, Harold, Glenn, and two new survivors, Mark Braddock and Perion McCarthy. They are camping in what used to be the Kunkel Fairgrounds in Kunkel, Ohio. Being from Ohio, I can tell you that Kunkel, Ohio, is a real place, and no, I have never been there. So they're sleeping in this abandoned fairground, and Fran is trying to sleep. She's having difficulty. The rest of the group have been taking a half a grain of Veronal, I hope I'm saying that right, to sleep as it helps combat the bad dreams they're all having. But not Fran. She's merely been palming her dosage, unsure as to whether or not it would actually harm the baby. So Fran is still awake, and she's thinking about Harold and how emotionally unstable he's become. Harold was a great source of information for them. Uh, He seems to know just about everything. And he's also carrying around two guns now. And Fran is worried that he might just snap one day and start firing. He's also been extremely argumentative with Stu. These days, if Stu Redman said a fire truck was red, Harold Lauder would produce facts and figures, proving that most of them these days were green. I think it's safe to say that we all know people like Harold. (laughs) If you don't, you are very lucky. In order to combat some of the abrasiveness towards him, Stu has taken to asking Harold's advice when decisions were to be made um, in order to keep him complacent. But Stu is also quietly asking Glenn for the same advice. So while the others are having these dreamless sleeps, Fran was still having nightmares about the dark man. In her nightmares, uh, he's still chasing her through her home, her childhood home, And it might not have been so bad if she wasn't dragging her father's dead body with her. She's too scared to leave him behind, worried that the dark man would do something horrible to desecrate Peter Goldman's corpse. But when the dark man finally catches up to Fran, he is always carrying a twisted coat hanger. And that's when Fran knows that he doesn't want her father's dead body, but Fran's living child right out of her womb. We learn that Fran has been keeping a diary since July 5th, mostly for her baby, to tell it how the plague had come to a gun quit, how she and Harold had escaped, and what had become of them. She wanted her child to know how things had been before the superflu. She thinks of Harold again, 
and how it might not have been so bad if Perion and Mark hadn't already been committed to each other when they found them. Perion was 33, 11 years older than Mark, but that didn't make much of a difference in this new world. They had found each other and taken care of each other. Perion had confided to Fran that she and Mark were trying to make a baby. Fran very nearly told her about being pregnant. She was over a third of the way now, but she hadn't wanted to make things harder on Perion. So there are six of them now, but the situation hadn't changed with the addition of another woman. And what was it that Fran wanted? Fran wanted a man like Stu Redman. No, no, not someone like him. She wanted him. Fran seems to understand that in this new world, a pregnant woman was vulnerable. The idea of women's lib had changed. The rednecks could grunt about burning bras. The reactionaries could play intellectual little games. But the truth only smiles. Fran knows that she needs a man. It wasn't just a matter of self-preservation and the preservation of her baby. But Stu attracted her especially after having been with Jess Ryder. Stu was calm, capable, and not at all what her father would have called 20 pounds of bullshit in a 10-pound bag. And Freya knew Stu was attracted to her as well. She knew that perfectly well, had known it since that first lunch together on the 4th of July in that deserted restaurant. For a moment, just one moment, their eyes had met, and there had been that instant of heat, like a power surge when all the needles swing over to overload. She guessed Stu knew how things were too, but he was waiting on her, letting her make the decision, in her own time. She had been with Harold first, therefore she was Harold's chattel. A stinking macho idea, but she was afraid this was going to be a stinking macho world again, at least for a while. Fran supposed it would have been easier had there been someone for Harold, and she thought of the day that Harold, in his clumsy way, had tried to make love to her, to make his claim of ownership irrevocable about two weeks ago. It seemed longer because the past seemed longer now. Between her worry of what to do about Harold and her fears of what he might do if she did go to Stuart, and her fear of the dreams, she would never get to sleep. So thinking, she drifted off. It was still dark when someone woke her, Harold. He tells her that Mark is sick. For a moment, Fran worries it was a belated case of Captain Tripp's, which, if that was true, meant any of them could get it. Maybe the germ was still hanging around, maybe it had mutated. But no, it's not the flu. Glenn thinks it's Mark's appendix. Fran gets up to find Glenn and Stu standing over Mark and Parian. Parian is distraught, insisting that they help them. Fran feels guilty, almost accused that she's healthy, and she selfishly thinks of her baby, that she should put some distance between her and Mark in case he had something catching. Glenn isn't sure what to do. Mark has all the symptoms of appendicitis. He asks Stu and Harold what they suggest, and Harold blurts out, give him aspirin, which understandably frustrates Parian. Is that the best he can do with all of his big talk smartassery? Harold doesn't respond, but he accepts the rebuke. Stu tells Parian that Harold is right, and it's the best they can do. Parian is angry that no one knows what to do, but Mark tells her to leave them alone. He would rather be dead anyway, if the pain continues, so he wants some aspirin. Glenn pulls Stu and Fran aside. Um, He has no clue what to do here. Neither do Stu or Fran. Glenn hopes that it's just Mark's bowels, but Fran points out that if it was... Mark wouldn't have the fever, and his belly wouldn't have swollen up. It had almost looked as if a tumor had swelled up there overnight. It made her feel ill to think about it. She could not remember when, except for when she was dreaming the dreams, she had been so badly frightened. What was it Harold had said? There's no doctor in the house. How true it was. How horribly true. God, it was all coming at her at once, crashing down all around her. How horribly alone they were, how horribly far out on the wire they were, and somebody had forgotten the safety net. She looked from Glenn's strained face to Stu's. She saw deep concern in both of them, but no answers in either of them. Mark screams with pain behind them, and Fran is feeling helpless. What would she do if it turned out she needed a cesarean? From here, we are taken into Fran's diary entries, starting from July 6th, when Glenn has agreed to come with them on their journey to Stovington. 
Fran is pretty detailed in her entries, and she doesn't really hold back on what she thinks of people. She even calls Harold a real booger snot. <laughs> I don't know why that made me laugh so much it did. She documents how Glenn explained his desire to go with them, unable to turn down the opportunity. Stu asks what opportunity, but Harold cuts in, in his snotty way, that Glenn sees an opportunity to see the formation of a society firsthand. Glenn agrees that's mostly it, but he also has theories he's written down, and he hopes to prove or disprove them. The technological society has walked off the court, so to speak, but they've all left the basketballs behind. Someone will come along who remembers the game and teach it to the rest again. That's rather neat, isn't it? I'll to write it down later. Harold argues with Glenn that it sounds as though he thinks the whole arms race, pollution, and so on will start up again. Harold thinks that humans can't be that stupid, that this time there will be certain laws into place. He was eager for an argument. One of the things that makes Harold so hard to like is his desire to show off how much he knows. But Glenn doesn't argue. He simply says, time will tell, won't it? Fran writes down that they're heading for Stovington the next day, and that she knows Stu isn't fond of the idea because he's scared of that place. We learn that Glenn had decided to leave Kojak behind, but there was nothing else they could do, unless they found a motorcycle with a sidecar, and even then Kojak could get scared and jump out, hurt, or kill himself. Fran includes a list of things to remember in her diary. The Texas Rangers baseball team had a pitcher named Nolan Ryan, who pitched all kinds of no-hitters and things with his famous fastball, and a no-hitter is very good. There were TV comedies with laugh tracks, and a laugh track was people on tape laughing at the funny parts, and they were supposed to make you have a better time watching. You used to be able to get frozen cakes and pies at the supermarket and just thaw them out and eat them. Sarah Lee's strawberry cheesecake was my personal favorite. On July 7th, she writes that they rode all day, and her ass feels like hamburger. She has had bad dreams. Harold had also been dreaming of the dark man, and it drives him crazy that he can't explain how the both of them were dreaming the same dream. Stu is having dreams of an old black lady in Nebraska. Stu thinks she lives in Holland Home or Hometown or something like that, and he thinks he can find it on a map. Harold believes dreams are psycho Freudian manifestations of things we didn't dare think about when they were awake. This makes Stu angry, but he kept his temper. Harold believes the dreams he shared with Fran were just coincidences. Stu tells Glenn he wants to go to Nebraska after Stovington, and Glenn agrees. Why not? They have to go somewhere. Things to remember. There were gasoline shortages in the early 80s because everybody in America was driving something, and we had used up most of our oil supplies, and the Arabs had us by the short hairs. The Arabs had so much money, they literally couldn't spend it. There was a rock and roll group called The Who that sometimes used to finish their live performances by smashing their guitars and amplifiers. This was known as conceptuous consumption. July 8th, Harold had just finished his sign about an hour ago and put it on the front lawn of the Stovington CDC. Stu helped him put it up, and held his peace despite Harold's mean little jibes. Fran never believed Stu was lying about the CDC, and she was sure everybody was dead, but it was still an upsetting experience, and she had cried. Stu was also upset, and he was able to point to a window on the third floor and tell them that that had been his room. Fran writes, Harold turned toward him, and I could see him getting ready with one of his patented Harold Louder smart-ass comments. But then he saw Stu's face and shut up. I think that was very wise of him, actually. Harold wanted to go inside, but Stu protested. Why would they want to do that? It's a dead place. Harold doesn't care. He's going in. And Glenn and Fran join him, but they know Stu's story is true as soon as they open the door. The smell was like decayed tomatoes. Fran describes the building, how spooky it is, like a haunted house. She can understand why Stu didn't want to go inside with them. They found the bodies and moved to the third floor. It was made up like a hospital with airlock doors. There were a lot of bodies up there, too. And they eventually find a man who clearly didn't die from the flu, but a gunshot, meaning they had found Elder. Glenn looks around and says, I don't think we'd better say anything about this room to Stu. I believe he came very close to dying in here. 
Harold asks what Glenn means, and Glenn explains that he thinks the dead gentleman came there to kill Stu, and that Stu got the better of him. Fran doesn't understand why they would want to kill Stu if he was immune. That doesn't matter, Fran, he said. Sense didn't have much to do with this place from the way it looks. There is a certain mentality that believes in covering up. They believe in it with the sincerity and fanaticism that members of some religious groups believe in the divinity of Jesus. Because for some people, the necessity to continue covering up even after the damage is done is all important. It makes me wonder how many immunes they killed in Atlanta and San Francisco and the Topeka Viral Center before the plague finally killed them and made an end to their butchery. This asshole? I'm glad he's dead. I'm only sorry for Stu, who will probably spend the rest of his life having nightmares about him. And then Glenn walks over and kicks the dead man in his face. When they leave, Stu is sitting with his back to the gate. Fran writes that she had wanted to run to him and kiss him and tell him she was ashamed for all of them not believing him, for going on and on about the hard time they'd had, while he hardly said a thing about being nearly killed. And Fran writes that she's falling in love with Stu, and if it wasn't for Harold, she'd take her chances. This is when Stu tells them that he wants to go to Nebraska. Harold is too shaken from his time in the CDC building that he doesn't put up much of a resistance. Glenn explains that he's also dreamed of the old woman the night before, but says it could be because Stu told him about the dream, but it was remarkably similar. Before Harold can say anything else, Stu comes up with an idea to write down everything they can remember of their dreams over the past week, and then they could compare notes. It's just scientific enough that Harold cannot protest. Fran writes her nightmare about the dark man, leaving out the part about the baby, and the results are amazing. Harold, Stu, and Fran all dreamed about the dark man. Stu and Fran both visualized him in a monk's robe with no visible features. Harold's dream is that the dark man is always standing in a dark doorway, beckoning to him like a pimp. The shine of his eyes were like Weasel's eyes. Stu and Glenn's dreams of the old woman are also very similar. They agree she lives in Polk County, Nebraska. Glenn says Hemingway home, Stu Hollingford home. (laughs) Fran takes this to mean it probably means Hemingford home. They both seem to think that they could find it on a map. Glenn believes this is an authentic psychic experience, which of course Harold poo-poos, but he seems to have been given a lot of food for thought. Glenn agrees that they need to go somewhere, so why not Nebraska? Fran is relieved. She would rather have the old woman over the dark man any day. Things to remember. Hang loose meant don't get upset. Rad and gnarly were ways of saying a thing was good. No sweat meant you weren't worried. To boogie down was to have a good time. And lots of people wore t-shirts which said shit happens, which it certainly did and still does. I got grease was a pretty current expression. I first heard it just this year. That meant everything was going well. Digs, an old British expression, was just replacing pad or crash pad as an expression for the place you were living in before the superflu hit. It was very cool to say, I dig your digs. Stupid, huh? But that was life. I think this passage alone dates this book. (laughs) Rad and gnarly and hang loose. Uh, Very 80s, early 90s there. Um, I wonder, I haven't read the... Uh, first edition of this book. So I don't know if he changed the expressions for this things to remember um, passage. If he did, I I might have to go check that in my book. I'm going to have to look. But it does make me wonder what expressions we would be writing in our things to remember journal um, should the world ever end the way it did in the stand. (laughs) Something to think about. Back in the present, it's just afternoon, and Parian is asleep beside Mark who they had carefully moved to the shade hours earlier. Mark was in and out of consciousness. Glenn is positive now. That is Mark's appendix. Harold suggested operating on him, but Glenn says no, because they'll kill him. Even if they could open him up without having him plead to death, they wouldn't know his appendix from his pancreas. Nothing in there was labeled. Harold says Mark will die if they don't. But Glenn asks Harold if he wants to try it. Stu calms the building argument and reminds them that they don't have the supplies to operate on Mark anyway. Fran is very aware now 
of how these illnesses could lead to routine surgeries, and now those illnesses could kill them. Having one's appendix out was nothing, medically speaking, like having a baby was nothing, medically speaking. Fran agrees with Harold. If they just leave Mark alone, his appendix will burst and he'll die anyway, so they have to do something. Glenn asks why them, why not her? They don't even have a medical textbook. But Fran just doesn't understand. She's very upset, no doubt thinking about her own situation and how dangerous her situation could be now. Glenn reminds her that having an appendix out was nothing in the old days, but it's sure something now. Upset, Fran runs off, but she returns around three, feeling ashamed of herself. Parian is awake and tending to Mark with Harold. Stu and Glenn are gone. Harold explains that they've gone to Kunkel to look for a doctor's office. It seems they've decided to try and operate on Mark. Harold apologizes to Parian, and she responds that it's no one's fault. Unless there is a god, of course. If there is, it's his fault. And when she sees him, she intends on kicking him in the balls. We do get a little background here on Parian and Mark. Um, Parian had taught anthropology at NYU and had been active in a number of political causes. She had never been married. Mark had been better to her than she ever expected a man to be. The others she had known had either ignored her or lumped her in with other girls as a pig or skag. Mark might have been in the group which had always ignored her if conditions had been normal. They met in Albany, where Parian had been summering with her parents on the last day of June, and after some talk, they decided to get out of the city together. The next night, they became lovers, more out of desperate loneliness than any real attraction. Mark was good to Perry, and she began to love him. Perry now explains that being a college graduate is bullshit, because Mark is dying. And while they've been bullshitting each other in their dorms in college towns, Perry could tell them about the Midi Indians of New Guinea, and Harold could explain the literary technique of the later English poets, but what good does that do for Mark? If they had a med student, that would be one thing, but they don't. Perry Ann knows they're all afraid to touch Mark, and she is too, so she's not excluding herself from that. But at least Stu is willing to do something. Perry figures if anyone has a shot, it's Stu, because he used to work at a factory putting circuits into electronic calculators, so he's the only one who understands taking things apart. And Perry knows that what Stu and Glenn do will kill him. She's almost sure that it will, but it's better that Mark be killed while someone is trying to make him well than it would be for him to die while they all just stood around and watched him. Neither Fran nor Harold could respond to that, but Harold touches Fran's shoulder, which makes her feel like screaming. Stu and Glenn return around four o'clock with a couple of books and a doctor's bag. Stu can only promise that they'll try. At ten past four, Stu is kneeling on a rubber sheet that had been spread under the tree. Franny was holding open a textbook in front of him, and Glenn Bateman held a spool of fine white thread. Between them was an open case of stainless steel instruments, now stained with blood. Harold had left the group early, holding one hand cupped over his mouth. Stu announces that he's found the appendix, and he just might be able to take it out. Parian, who had been trying to get Stu's attention as he spoke, tells him that he doesn't need to do that, because Mark is dead. Stu looks at her, and she confirms that he had died two minutes ago. But she thanks Stu for trying. Stu turns away in despair. Glenn walks off, his shoulders hunched. Fran hugs Stu, assuring him that he did the best he could. It says, despite all her thoughts of the last three and a half weeks, despite her crushable crush, she had not made a single overt move. She had been almost painfully careful not to show the way she felt. The situation with Harold was just too much on a hair trigger. And she was not showing the true way she felt about Stu even now. Not really. It was not a lover's hug she was bestowing on him. It was simply one survivor clinging to another. Stu seemed to understand this. His hands came up to her shoulders and pressed them firmly, leaving bloody handprints on her khaki shirt, marking her in a way which seemed to make them partners in some unhappy crime. Somewhere a jay called harshly, and closer at hand, Parian began to weep. Harold Louder, who did not know the difference between hug survivors and lovers may bestow on each other, 
gazed at Franny and Stu with dawning suspicion and fear. After a long moment, he crashed furiously off into the brush and didn't come back until long after supper. Fran is woken early the next morning, someone shaking her. It's Stu this time, not Harold. She asks him what's wrong, but he tells her he was dreaming again, not of the old woman, but the dark man, and it had scared him. But she's frightened by the look on his face and asks him to say what he means. Stu explains that Parian got the Varanol out of Glenn's pack, and she's dead. Stu knows he has to wake Glenn and Harold, but he wonders when this will end. Fran says she doesn't think it ever will. July 12th of Fran's diary. They are in New York tonight, where they meet Mark and Parian. She writes a lot about Harold, or rather, the psychology of Harold. It reads, If you don't know him by now, you never will. Underneath his swagger and all those pompous pronouncements, there is a very insecure little boy. He can't really believe that things have changed. Part of him, quite a large part, I think, has to go on believing that all his high school tormentors are going to rise out of their graves one fine day and start shooting spitballs at him again, or maybe calling him whack off louder, as Amy said they used to. Sometimes I think it would have been better for him, and maybe me too, if we hadn't hooked up back in a gun quit. I'm part of his old life. I was best friends with his sister once upon a time, and so on and so on. What sums up my weird relationship with Harold is this. Strange as it may seem, knowing what I know now, I would probably pick Harold to be friends with instead of Amy. Harold is, in his own weird way, sort of cool. When he's not concentrating all his mental energies on being an asshole, that is. But you see, Harold can never believe that anyone could think he was cool. Part of him has such a huge investment in being square. He is determined to carry all of his problems right along with him into this not-so-brave new world. He might as well have them packed right beside his knapsack, along with those chocolate payday candy bars he likes to eat. Things to remember? The Gillette Parrot. Please don't squeeze the Charmin. The walking Kool-Aid pitcher that used to say, oh yeah. OB tampons, created by a female gynecologist. Converse All-Stars, Night of the Living Dead. Brr, that one hits too close to home. I quit. July 14th is the day that Fran writes that Harold suggested stocking up on Varanol, seeing if it would disrupt the dream cycle. Harold believes the whole sharing dreams thing is getting ridiculous, but Glenn explains that whenever something paranormal occurs, the only explanation that really fits well and holds its logic in the, is the theological one. That's why psychics and religion have always gone hand in hand. Glenn feels like everyone's psychic, but it's so ingrained in us that we rarely notice it. Glenn is essentially trying to explain how they're all having such similar dreams. He describes a man named James Staunton who studied the occult as a hobby. He got stats on over 50 plane crashes since 1925. He was correlating three factors. Those present on any such conveyance that met with disaster, those killed, and the capacity of the vehicle. He fed a second series of stats into a computer this time, an equal number of planes and trains that didn't meet with disaster, and found that full planes and trains rarely crashed. Harold calls bullshit on this, but Glenn explains that in cases where trains or planes crashed, the capacity was at 61%. In cases where they didn't crash, the vehicles were running at 76 capacity. His deduction was that people know which planes and trains are going to crash, and they're unconsciously predicting the future. Quote, Your Aunt Sally gets a bad stomach ache just before Flight 61 takes off from Chicago bound for San Diego. And when the plane crashes in the Nevada desert, everyone says, Oh, Aunt Sally, that bellyache was really the grace of God. But until James Stoughton came along, no one had realized that there were really 30 people with belly aches or headaches, or just that funny feeling you get in your legs when your body is trying to tell your head that something is getting ready to go way off course. Just after finishing his article on James Stoughton, an aircraft crashed at Logan Airport and killed everyone on board. After the fact, Glenn called the airline office and said he was a reporter, asking how many no-shows there were on the flight that day. The man said it was 16. 
Glenn asked him what the average was on 747 flights from Denver to Boston, and the man said three. The man went further and said they had 15 cancellations as well. So although the headlines read, Logan Air Crash Kills 94, it should have said 31 Avoid Death and Logan Airport Disaster. From there, Fran explains that there was more talk about psychic stuff and it wandered far from the subject of their dreams. But eventually, Glenn comes back around to it. What interests me about these dreams, he went on, is that they seem to presage some future struggle. We seem to be getting cloudy pictures of a protagonist and an antagonist, an adversary, if you like. If that's so, it may be like looking at a plane on which we're scheduled to fly and getting a bellyache. We're being given the means to help shape our own futures, perhaps, a kind of fourth dimensional free will, the chance to choose in advance of events. But Fran points out that they don't know what the dreams mean, but Glenn believes they may eventually. He thinks they're a constructive force in spite of their ability to frighten. He's having second thoughts about the Vernal. Taking it is like swallowing some Pepto-Bismol to quiet the bellyache and then getting on the plane anyway. Things to remember. Recessions. Shortages. The prototype Ford Growler that could go 60 miles on the highway on a single gallon of gas. Quite the wonder car. That's all. I quit. If I don't shorten my entries, the diary will be as long as Gone with the Wind, even before the Lone Ranger arrives, although please, not on a white horse named Silver. Oh yes, one other thing to remember. Edgar Casey. Can't forget him. He supposedly saw the future in his dreams. On July 16th, Fran only notes two things here. One is that Glenn has been very pale and silent the last two days, and she saw him take an extra-large dose of Veronal. She suspects he skipped the last two, and the result was some very bad dreams. It worries her, but she's not sure how to approach it. The second is her own dreams. She finally had a dream of the old lady. She has nothing to add beyond what's already been said, other than that she seems to exude an aura of niceness, of kindness. She can understand why Stu wanted to go to Nebraska, even in the face of Harold's sarcasm. Fran woke, feeling completely refreshed, thinking if they could just get to Mother Abigail, then everything would be okay. Fran hopes she's really there. Things to remember, Mother Abigail. And that is the end of Chapter 46. This chapter is told solely through Fran's point of view, and mostly through her diary entries. It shifts between the present and the past when Fran began her diary, with her first entry being July 6th. A lot of Fran's diary entries deal with her conflicting thoughts about Harold. She is also an incredibly talented documentarian <laughs> because she can apparently remember full conversations to write down after the fact, which is something I could never do. I could probably sum things up, but I can't do full quotes like that. Obviously, this is probably uh, solely for King to convey these moments, but it's interesting that he chose to do it through Fran's diary rather than just writing the scenes as they happened. Maybe this was to show Harold through Fran's eyes. And is that skewing our perception of Harold? We haven't really been inside Harold's head yet, so if we get to it, it'll be interesting to see what he's thinking, as opposed to how Fran and Stu view him. Glenn did agree to come along with Stu, Fran, and Harold, and sadly had to leave Kojak behind, which is a really depressing thought. Um, although we know Kojak will probably be able to take care of himself, but... Given how many times they mentioned that most dogs were killed by this flu, the fact that Kojak is still alive is probably pretty significant, so maybe we will see him again. So we learn through Fran's diary that the four continue their journey to the CDC, and as Stu told them, everybody inside is dead. He's even able to point out his room on the third floor. And I think at this point, Fran and Glenn, they do believe Stu's story, and I'm not really sure that they ever really doubted him. Um, but this was more for Harold, and Harold felt like he had something to prove by going inside. From there, they make the sign informing other survivors of their plan to head toward Nebraska, and we know that Larry and company have since come across that message. Along their way through New York, they meet two new survivors, Mark and Perian, two people who found each other while in Albany and left the city together, very reminiscent of Larry and Rita. Um... 
Unfortunately, we don't get a lot of Mark and Perry in because Fran's diary entries are interspersed with Mark's bout of appendicitis. I think Mark and Perry in were used here to drive home the fact that Captain Trips has really decimated the way everybody was used to living. I mean, sure, a lot of the food is spoiled and they can't travel the way they used to. But now, something that should be nothing, like getting an appendix taken out, can be very deadly. There are no hospitals, no 911, um, who knows how many doctors are left in the world. Nobody is at the ready to help you in a life or death situation, or even a broken bone. Take Gina from the last chapter. She broke her leg falling out of a barn. If it hadn't been for Dick and Tom and Nick hearing her and Dick having enough medical expertise to set the leg, she probably would have died. And no one traveling with Fran has any idea how to operate on another human being. And can you imagine having to do that without the proper supplies or pain relief? There's no mention that they had any numbing agent. But Stu steps up to at least try, because it really did come down to watching Mark die a painful death from his appendix bursting, or watching him die from an attempt to save his life. Um, And this is very telling of Stu's character. Um, We don't really know if he did it just because, you know, he's a stand-up guy, that's who he is, or because Fran was so upset that they weren't going to help, or at least weren't going to try. There are really no good choices here, but at least they did try. Um, Unfortunately, Mark dies anyway, and that night... Perian overdoses uh, purposefully on sleeping pills. And so it's a depressing reminder here that life will never be the way it was. Although Glenn does believe that it will be in some ways. He and Harold disagree on how society will reform. Glenn believes society will be just as it was before. And Harold thinks humans aren't that stupid. But I tend to side with Glenn here. We also see this group realizes that they're sharing the same dreams. Harold refuses to think of this as anything more than a coincidence, which really speaks volumes about his stubbornness and his desire to just argue for argue's sake. Or maybe he's just scared of what the dreams might mean. But it's strange to me that he could blow this off. Um, Four people having similar dreams blow that off as just a coincidence. That's a pretty damn big coincidence. (laughs) Glenn believes that we all have a psychic tendency, um, but it's so ingrained in us that we don't notice it. And honestly, I think a lot of Glenn's information dump on psychic ability and his studies was maybe a bit unnecessary. It was fascinating, but it was like King found this stuff uh, to be really interesting himself and just wanted to share it, maybe even to try and explain how they're all having these dreams at once. I don't really think it needed that kind of explanation. I think the supernatural aspect of it is better left up in the air. Uh, Glenn is very, he's a very logical scientific person. Um, And it's interesting to me that he believes in psychic phenomena. At the same time, it just felt like that particular part dragged a bit. Um, Hats off to Fran for remembering every word of it. (laughs) But Glenn believes that these dreams are just a sign of things to come that they're constructive despite how scary they are. Uh, It seems he even forgoes the sleeping pills to experience them again and quickly regrets it. I did, however, like his explanation that these dreams could just be giving them a glimpse, um, letting them choose their future path. Um, An adversary, a protagonist, Mother Abigail and Randall Flagg, and these characters are finally catching on as well, that... These dreams, good and bad, are giving them the opportunity to choose which path they're going to go down. Fran is also palming her sleeping pills. She's not wanting to hurt the baby. Obviously, nobody knows she's pregnant yet, uh, but she's having horrible dreams about the dark man in a coat hanger. And she sees Mark's situation with his appendix and realizes that's the kind of trouble she could be in just from giving birth. Because giving birth should be nothing just like getting an appendix taken out. But now it's something, and she could die. The baby could die, um, not just from being born, but from the flu. There's no promise that this baby is immune to Captain Trips. And what if she needs a cesarean? 
I'm sure a lot of Fran's emotion is from Mark's pain and his chances of death, but probably more of it stems from her fear of her own circumstances. We already knew from the last chapter with Stu, Fran, and Harold that Stu was attracted to Fran, and now we see here from Fran herself that she's also attracted to Stu and probably falling in love with him. But Harold has kept her from pursuing her feelings. She doesn't want to upset Harold, who seems to think he has some claim on Fran, and Stu won't pursue her for that reason, too. And this part is very frustrating because who cares what Harold thinks? (laughs) With the world being the way it is now, it would seem that Fran should just take happiness where she can get it. Then again, Harold seems to be of a bit of a wild card at the moment, especially carrying two guns. He's abrasive and snarky and argumentative with just about everyone, and he does not seem to be mentally stable, at least not to Fran. So she's trying to hold back on her feelings for Stu as not to make the situation explode. For me, Harold is pretty much an insufferable character, but I do understand that he's proven helpful to the group due to his intelligence, so it's hard to say, you know, just ditch him. Plus, that doesn't seem to be something Fran could bring herself to do anyway. She thinks she might have been friends with Harold if he had been easier to get along with. I also really liked Fran's little things to remember in her journal, and that's very smart, a way to document the way the world was um, as they knew it before it ended, but also the small details that would probably slip one's mind after a while. I think we'll be getting more of these throughout the book, and... um, I think it's very interesting that King gave Fran that character, the diary, to give us more insight um, from her point of view of how things are happening around her. I'm sure we're going to see that again. Um, And it's kind of fun to read from her point of view and her true thoughts and feelings about people, things she might not say to their face, but would write in her diary where she feels like she can be honest. It adds another layer um, to the story, and I think that's needed. I would actually thinking about it while I was reading this chapter, and maybe being in the situation we're all in now, if you were to keep a journal about how things are um, happening in the world, and let's just say hypothetically, we were in the situation of the stand, and you had a journal, and you had to write things to remember, what would you write down? What things would you want to remember? Not, you know, super important things and events, but just the little things like the Kool-Aid man, pop culture, the way, you know, current slang, I guess. Um, I would love to know what you guys would write down. If you do want to tell me, you can email me at the circle closes at gmail.com because I would absolutely love to hear it. And if I get enough of you writing me, I will share them on a future episode. So this is a really interesting group of people. Um, Glenn, the sociologist, Stu, who seems to have a good heart and a good head on his shoulders, as quiet as he is, and patient when having to deal with Harold, who just seems defensive, argumentative, and an all-around pain in the ass, and Fran, who is dealing with the secret of her pregnancy, her fears and feelings. Mark and Parian seem like just a blip in the grand scheme of things, but even their story is quite tragic. But now we know that the remaining four are headed for Nebraska. After Stu's experiment, where everyone needed to write details down from their dreams to compare, Even Harold couldn't really argue with heading towards Hemingford home to find Mother Abigail. Harold, who has only dreamed of the dark man, Fran feels like uh, Abigail exudes kindness and goodness, and she feels like she's home when she's in that dream, which is how Nick and the others had felt as well. So Harold is only dreaming of the dark man. Is he dreaming of Abigail? Because if he is, he's not saying so. That could be an interesting um, point right there. We're going to stick with this group next week as they come across a new group of survivors, some of who are not so nice. And we will also get some more entries in Fran's diary and um, she and Stu's feelings for each other finally come to a head. And that is next week in Chapter 47. And that is it for this episode of The Circle Opens. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can leave me a rating review on Apple Podcasts or any platform in which you listen. Um, Thank you to everybody who has already left me a review or a rating. I really do appreciate it. It truly makes my day, especially in these uncertain times when I'm stuck at home and slowly losing my mind. (laughs) 
<laughs> so thank you to everybody who's done that already. Um, you can follow me on social media at The Circle Opens, or like I mentioned earlier, uh, you can email me at The Circle Closes. Send me your things to remember. Send them to me, please. You can even send them on social media. I don't care. Just throw them at me. I would love to hear them. I would love to tell you guys about them in a future episode. And that's it for this week, you guys. Stay safe, stay healthy, and M-O-O-N, that spells, see you next week. Bye.